Well, I haven't said it yet. I've been saving it. I know I did announcements. Good morning. It's sort of become a tradition that I get made fun of a lot, but I'm okay with that. All right. So uh, this morning, uh, we're starting our Hot Topic series. As you can see, we're diving into God's Word and, oh, thank you. We're diving into God's Word, and we're seeing what He has to say about difficult issues, about controversial issues, about issues that we can ignore. And before we dive into this series, I want to give you four reasons why we're doing this series. And the first reason that we are doing this series is love. Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. We are a church that loves Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So when we face a difficult or controversial issue, what do we do? We go to God's word because we love God. We love Jesus. We see what his word has to say about it like we're doing in this series. And then we seek to to live according to it. All because we love God. The next reason why we're doing this Hot Topics Difficult Subject Series is because we want to connect, we want to unify as the body of Christ. We want to be more than just superficial, high and by relationships. We want more than that. We want Philippians 2, where the text says at the end of verse 2, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in a full accord and of one mind. We want to be that tight-knit close family of God. And we're not going to get there if we ignore difficult subjects, if we're constantly pushing them aside. So we're diving into this hot topic series because we love God, because we want to connect with the body of Christ, and also because we want to share Christ. We want to proclaim who He is and what He's about. And we just don't want to proclaim parts of Him. We want to proclaim all of Him. As Paul says in Acts chapter 20, we want to declare the whole counsel of God. So we're in this series because we want to love, connect, and share Christ. And lastly, because we want to thrive in Christ. Jesus says in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So often people view this as sort of like God's fun-sucking freedom-sucking vacuum. But nothing can be further from the truth, correct? We have a God who is out to rescue and who is out to bless. He's so out to rescue and He's so out to bless that He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to pay the price for all our sin, to rescue us from the penalty of our own sin so that all of us who simply believe in Him, put our trust in Him, can have eternal life. Life. He's out to rescue and bless us, and He's given us this word. Why? Why? Because He wants us to use it as a tool, a sword, to break away the chains of confusion, the chains of shame, guilt, and our own inadequacy. He wants us to free us from that. He wants to rescue us from that and give us the opportunity to know the truth that sets us free. Sets us free to do what? sets us free to glorify God and enjoy Him to the max. So we're in this series, this hot topic series, talking about difficult items that we tend to ignore because we want to love Christ. We want to connect on a deeper level as the body of Christ. We want to share all of Christ. And we want to thrive in the freedom-giving truth that He gives us. So that's why we're starting this hot topic series. Now the first question that we have after that is, what's the first topic? What are we going to talk about? And I picked a doozy, and it's money. Now, typically there are five reactions to a sermon on money. All right? And they're all negative. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. All right? First typical reaction is, I hate this topic. I hate this topic so much. Why? Because churches, pastors like you, John, church organizations, they have totally messed up when it comes to talking about money. They have robbed people blind. They have taken the gospel and they have made it into a money-making scheme. 
And you know what? I agree with all of that. I agree with all of that. And for that reason, in addition to the one I just mentioned, that's why we need to talk about it. So we're living according to what Christ says and not according to the error of this world. The second way in which people react to a sermon on money is fear. It's, I hope there's no one new today. I so hope there's no one new. I hope he doesn't offend anyone. I hope there's some people in the pews left over for next week. It's all this fear, and trust me, I know that fear. I felt that all this week. All right? But you know what? Second Timothy 1 7 says, God has not given us the spirit of, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. So when we come to God's word, we don't come to it and we don't present it with fear. We present it, we present it with love, yes. We present it with humility, yes. But we present it with boldness because this is the omniscient word of God that's without error, that sets us free. If we love God and we love others, we present it like it's real because it is real, because it's God's word. So we don't come to this with shame and fear. We come to this with boldness and love and we proclaim it as such. The next reaction, negative reaction to a message or a few messages on money is, ah, I know exactly what's going on. You want the budget to be bigger or we're not meeting budget or you want to raise or better yet, we're going to start a building campaign and we're, we're going to start this massive building campaign so we can have this mega church so you can plaster your name all over it and we can pay for it, John. I'm on the end. I know this. Well, you're wrong. The budget's fine. I don't need a raise and a building with my name on it isn't worth diddly squat. All right? You better do <laughs> No, that's... I thought I went far enough. <laughs> but it's the truth. We should be saying amen to that. We should be saying... <laughs> One's enough, you're totally throwing me off. All right. <laughs> wow, you throw me off. All right, but we should be saying, we should be thankful, we should be saying, okay, yes, it's not about that. We recognize that this is a difficult subject and we take it a million different wrong ways, but it's still the Word of God and we won't avoid it. We won't avoid the Word of God. We follow the Word of God. So we're going to talk about this. Another reaction, negative, is when a person starts a sermon or a sermon is preached on it, on money, they go like this. Yes. Yes. This is the one sermon that I don't have to worry about being convicted in because I'm poor. Yes. John, preach it. Give it to him. Make those rich people squirm in their seats. I want to see them sweat. There's a problem with that, a very serious problem, and it has to do with where we live. All right? Did you know that if a person makes more than $33,000 a year, they are in the top 1% richest people of the world? Did you know if you make 25,000, well, let me put that in perspective. If you make $33,000 or more, you are wealthier than 6,930,000,000 people. Usually we measure how like poor and our financial status by how many people are above us, but you just look below us and we get a better perspective. If a person makes $25,000 a year, they're still in the top 2%. Listen to this. If a person makes $5,000 a year, $2.60 an hour at a full-time job, 40 hours a week, they're still in the top 20%. The truth is we live here in America and we are so wealthy. We are so wealthy. We are so wealthy. And you know something? Even if we're wealthy or poor, it doesn't matter. Because we're believers in Jesus Christ and we want to love Jesus Christ, so we follow Jesus Christ, so we look to his word, we submit to it, and we seek to follow it no matter what. No matter what our financial status is, we say, God, you're in control, I'm following you. The last reaction is probably the most prevalent. When money is brought up in church, it's to say, how dare you? How dare you Get behind that imaginary pulpit without a tie 
and tell me how to use and spend my money. How dare you tell me what I should do with my car, my house, my retirement, my saving, my, 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 my money. But there's a major problem with that. And the problem with that is this tells us that it's not your car, that it's not my house, that it's not my banking account. It's all God's. He owns it. He made it. He owns it. And He still owns it. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about this sticky issue of money. And today we're going to concentrate on this fact that it all belongs to God. It's His. So we're going to manage it. We're going to seek to manage it as He wants us to manage it. Please open in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. We're going to see this definite truth lived out in David. When you have found 1 Chronicles chapter 29, please stand out of joyful reverence for the reading of God's truth. First Chronicles chapter 29, starting in verse 10, reads, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, God of, our, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, O oh God, and praise your glorious name. This is the truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In our passage, this passage, David's at the end of his life. He has been serving for several decades of king, as king. It's been several, it's been four decades actually since he's slain Goliath, since that amazing feat. And since then, he has brought Israel to a great point, a great point of power, not only in terms of military, but also in terms of finances. He has led the nation in this phenomenal way. He's also written scripture by this point. He's written multiple psalms. He has all these phenomenal accomplishments, all of them. You just go off. You think of Saul in comparison to him. We have Saul is slain his, ten, his thousands, and then the people sing, David is slain his Come on, it's part of a song, you should sing it. All right, we're not going to do that. All right, it's all, you read David's life and it's absolutely phenomenal what he's able to accomplish. It is great. In fact, right before this, what does he do? We read verses one through five and what is he doing? He is making this exorbitant, can't say that word, massive, massive gift unto God. And what does that giving unto God do? That inspires the rest of the people in verses 6 through 9 to also give gifts unto God, to praise Him. He is a man, He is a great leader. And yes, He did fail. And He did fail multiple times. But in that failure, He was humble, He went to God, He repented, He turned from His sin and lived unto God, and God gave Him the label that we all want. To be a person after God's own heart. And it's here in this passage, at the end of David's career, his phenomenal career, that he says all of this. That we get a glimpse of what his heart is all about. Look at the first verse, verse 10. Chapter 29. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. 
He's ending his career. He's coming close to the end of his life. He's not whining about all the hardships God has allowed him to go through. He's not pointing to any of his military victories. He's not pointing to anything in and of himself. All he's doing is pointing to God. You, 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 you deserve to be blessed. And he's doing this in front of everybody. This is the opportunity, a prime opportunity to say, look at me. But he's looking to God. And he's saying how great you are. And we find out why in verse 11. It says, yours, O Lord. Notice the pronoun that's going to run through this whole thing. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all, for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and your hand, and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. David has come to a place where he believes that God is God. That all of his victories, that all of his accomplishments on the battlefield, all of his accomplishments in terms of diplomacy and expanding the kingdom of Israel, none of the glory goes to him. It all goes to God because he is the maker of all things. He's the sustainer of all things. And he couldn't have done it without God working through him. It's all about him. It's all about you, God. And when it comes to his finances, what's it all about? It's all about coming from your hand, God. It's all about being used by you, God, to give back unto you. It's fully and utterly absent of those phrases, my home, my car, my wallet, my career. It's all yours, 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 and yours. I mean, look at the next verse, verse 14, actually. I love this, what he says. He starts out verse 14 saying, but who am I? And I'm tempted to say, David, come on. Like, you're the guy. You are the man. You are the one who entered into a Philistine camp all by yourself and slaughtered a hundred all by yourself. You're like the man. You're the man who killed Goliath. You're the man who's led the nations. You're the guy who's written scripture. But he has a proper perspective in which none of the glory goes to him and it all goes to God. It's all you, 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 and you. Who am I to even stand before you? And look what he says next after that. But who am I and what is my people? Well, they're a pretty great people. They've been moving forward. They've been growing. But he recognizes it's not him. It's not anyone else. It's all glory. It's all ownership of God. And look at what he says. Look at what he says. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? He's talking about his offering that he just gave in the first six verses and the other people gave in the, in the subsequent three verses, six through, six through nine. He's like, how are we even able to do this? It sort of doesn't make sense to me. And he keeps on going. For all things come from you and of your own have we given. David is talking about this. The flow of finances. The finances start with God since He owns all things and He delivers them to us for the purpose of us enjoying the fact that we can live and give them back unto Him. And he's like, wow. I'm totally superfluous in this process. You don't need to include me. But yet you give me this opportunity to receive from you and give unto you. He's absolutely floored. He knows. He believes that God owns all. And he's allowed him. He's giving him an opportunity to participate, to touch, to handle, to manage what's God's. And he just can't get over it. And this is not the only passage where we see this truth that God owns all and we're simply managing his funds Absolutely not. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. A few pages back. Quite a few. And let me set up Deuteronomy chapter 8 for you. What's happening in this passage? Israel is just about to go into the land of promise. The land flowing with milk and honey. God has delivered them from Egypt. And what did God give them when he delivered them from Egypt? 
All of the Egyptians were so thrilled that they were leaving, so wanted them to leave, were so defeated by God's deliverance that they poured money on them. That they showered them with their wealth because they just so wanted the Israelites to leave and for God not to continually oppress them until they leave them. So the Israelites are delivered from Egypt by God. They're empowered and they are made wealthy by God through the process. And then they go through the wilderness for 40 years and God sustains them in a powerful way. He sustains them even to the point of their sandals they don't wear out. That's the type of shoe that you want. All right? God sustains them. God sustains them. God sustains them. And then he brings them to the doorway, essentially, of the land of Canaan. He says, you're about to enter this area. You're about to conquer more. You're about to earn more. You're about to be wealthier than you've ever been. And I know you, Israel. I know you that once you accomplish these things, or I accomplish them through you, and you acquire all this wealth that I want for you, you're going to think you earned it. You're going to think it's all about you. You might fall into that trap. And God is so loving, He's so just, that He reminds them not to fall into this trap. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17. He says, Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of My hand have gotten Me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as is this day. So God's reminding them, the flow of finances starts with me and it goes to you and I want you to manage it in a way that's honoring to me. And we see this throughout Scripture, not just in the Old Testament. In Psalms 24.1, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Haggai 2.8, God says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Job 41.11, Who has given to me that I should repay him? Everything under heaven is mine. 1 Corinthians 10.26, we move into the New Testament, where the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Speaking of Jesus Christ, Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Starting point of finances is God. Starting point of resources is God. Starting point of life is God. And he gives unto us, allows us to be part of the process to manage his money in a way that glorifies him and does bring us joy. So we see clearly just from these two passages and the multiple passages that we reference that God owns everything and we are simply managers of what he has allowed us to manage. So the question goes on from there, how do we manage God's money? How do we do that? Has he given us direction? Yes. In fact, I'm going to point out seven ways from God's word from which he wants to manage, he wants us to manage his money how he wants us to invest, what he wants us to spend on. So we're going to look at seven ways the owner wants us to manage his resource, his finances. And the first is found in 1 Corinthians 9.14. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be shifting a lot here to get these seven points. Some of them are going to be closer together than others. So 1 Corinthians 9. 14. It says, In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And some are saying, Really? You're going to start with that one? Come on! You could have put it like fourth, fifth, sixth, maybe not mention it. How can you even say that? Well, I don't say that today to boost myself up or condemn you in any way. I say that and I put that first because the very first thing I wanted to say in this list is thank you. Because you guys obey this, you generally obey that, you generously obey this in a phenomenal way. Kimberly and I feel absolutely loved and supported by your obvious generosity. So I put that at the beginning because I could not wait to say thank you for your generous obedience to this command. Let's go on to the next one. 
The next one is in Romans 12, verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. The passage starts out reading, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And here it is. Here is a directive in how we are to manage God's money. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. There are two there. First, contribute to the needs of the saints and then show hospitality. I just want to say, you do a phenomenal job of contributing to the needs of the saints. Every uh, month we have Communion Sunday. We, we celebrate communion once a month. And at the end of that Sunday service, we have the men standing in the, at the end of the aisles holding baskets at the end of the service. And what's that called? That's called the Benevolent Fund in which you have generously given. You put your money in there and where does all that money go? It all goes to contributing to the needs of the saints, helping out the body of Christ with financial struggle. So you are doing this well. And there's another awesome note here. You know that Costa Rica missions trip that we went on that you supported, that you gave to, that you contributed to because we had a need to pay for that trip? Well, you were so generous, you were so loving, that you gave us $5,000 beyond what we actually spent. That's how generous and loving you are. That's how much you're contributing to the needs of the saints. And what the great thing is, we get to take that money, and we're going to still use it for Costa Rica. We're going to get to give it to our missionaries in Costa Rica and bless them with it. And won't that be a phenomenal moment? I can't wait for the moment when I hear Noah say, What? Really? That's going to be a blessed moment. You're doing this so well. James chapter 5 extends this command. It says, don't only contribute to the saints, but also contribute to those who you're seeking to witness to, which is all the world. So what are we called to do? We're called to contribute to everyone's needs as we see, as God allows us to. And you know what? As a church, I believe you guys are doing a phenomenal job. You have heart and hands in the building, which we support, which we serve in, which serves and provides general needs for the community. We have Lansing City Rescue Mission, which we are supporting. We are contributing to the needs of the saints and to the needs around us. And that's a blessed thing. That's a good thing. And God is working among us to allow us to manage his money the way he wants us to. He is working among us. We're contributing to the needs of the saints. And I just want to, I've talked about corporate level here, how we're all as the body of Christ serving in a general way in various areas and following this command. But just just think about those opportunities that you've had where you have seen a fellow saint in need, just personally, or another person in need, and you got to manage God's money this way. You just think of that moment where you got to manage God's money this way and you got to see the expression on that person's face who was in need when you provided that need through the work of God. When you got to hear them talk about, maybe you did it in secret where you contributed to someone's need and they're talking about it with everyone else, they don't know you did it and you just hear that and you just think, God is so good. He gives me the opportunity to manage his money in this way way. I would encourage us to look for these opportunities more and more. The second way we're called to manage God's money is to seek to show hospitality. Now, hospitality takes time. Hospitality also can take a piece of our sanity. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think you know what I'm talking about. But it also, in a very practical sense, can cost money. But God wants us to be hospitable. He wants us to use his money, manage it in such a way that we are demonstrating hospitality. Why does God want us to do that? Because he is hospitable. Just think about it this way. We live in this awesome place, this awesome universe created by God. And I sort of think of it as sort of like a home. And he's allowed you and I to stay in it our entire lives. 
He's allowed you and I to dwell in his creation despite the fact that we complain, despite the fact that we rebel against him, despite the fact that we sin, he allows us to dwell within what he's created. When we break his house rules, he allows us to dwell here. And you know what? He's so hospitable that he sends his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins so that if we believe in him, when this heavens and earth is destroyed, he's going to invite us into the next home. He's going to invite us into the new heavens and new earth. Our God is a hospitable God. And he wants us to take his money and manage it in such a way that we too are displaying that hospitality. The next way God has called us to manage his money, you just scroll down the page, chapter 13, verse 8. This one's a little different. Or excuse me, verse 7. Chapter 13, Romans, verse 7. It reads, Pay to all what is owed... Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. He's saying pay your taxes. God wants us to take his money and manage it and pay our taxes with it. And to that, some may be like, hmm, John, do you realize that we don't live in a Christian nation? Do you realize that our government funds abortion? Do you realize that we're no longer able to pray in schools? Do you realize that this nation seems to be going downward in so many ways? Why should I pay taxes? Why should I do that? Maybe it's a cultural thing. Maybe it's Paul lived in a culture that's different than ours. We live in a different one. Situation is different, so we don't have to obey that. Well, that doesn't work. Because what type of culture did Paul live in when he wrote this? He lived under Emperor Nero. And Emperor Nero was slaughtering Christians by the thousands. He would take Christians, dip them in oil, attach them to a beam, a cross, and light them on fire to light the highways. And yet Paul is saying here, with that, pay your taxes. This is what God wants you to do. And in one way, it totally makes sense, doesn't it? Because if we're constantly dealing with tax issues, constantly brought into the court of law, constantly distracted by that, what is that going to do? That's going to distract us. That's going to take us away from what our primary responsibility is. And that's to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to proclaim his name. Why would we lock ourselves up when we are called to go out? and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. So God's in authority, he owns it all, and he tells us to submit and pay our taxes. Now, I'm all about deductions. So long as they're legal deductions. So we pay our taxes because God owns all of the money, God owns everything, and we're managing his according to the way he wants us to. What's another way he wants us to manage our money? Look down to verse 8 of Romans chapter 13. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has filled the law. God does not want us to be under the weight, to be under the burden, to be under, as Proverbs 22 calls it, the slavery of debt. He does not want that for us. He knows that debt is depressing. He knows that debt is defeating. So his money... He allows us, he gives unto us. Why? So we can seek with all our heart, seek with all our mind to the best of our ability in which he provides to avoid and run from that. Pay it off as quickly as possible. God's in charge. He doesn't want us to owe anything. So he says, I own it all. Manage my money. You have debt. Seek with all your heart to get rid of it. What's the next way we can manage God's money appropriately? Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. This is a different one. In Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14, we have what's called the parable of the talents. And in this parable, there are three men, and then there's an owner. The owner represents God, and the three men represents different types of people attempting to serve God. And these three men, two of them, take the money that this owner provides for them, 
says, you're going to be my money manager. Here's the amount of money for you. Here's a specific amount of money for you. Manage my money. Two of them take that money and they manage it well. They use it. They invest it. And as a result, they get more. And then the owner comes back and says, good job. You didn't let it sit. You did something with it. You trusted me to work through you. So he utilizes, he rewards those servants. But there's a third servant who takes what God has given him and puts it in a hole and says, I'm scared. I'm afraid. God's the owner. And he's given me this responsibility. And I don't want to invest. I don't want to utilize it. I don't want to do anything with it. I'm just going to put it in a hole. And what does the owner say to that servant? We look at verse, what, 26 of Matthew chapter 25. It says, but his master, well, let's start up in uh, verse 24, actually. He also, he also, he also who had received the one talent came forward, this is the guy that put it in the ground, saying, Master, I knew you would be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I scatter no seed, that you ought to have an invested, uh, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what is my own with interest. So this servant who takes God's blessing, who takes God's responsibility that's been given upon him and shoves it in the ground, God says, No. We don't operate out of a spirit of fear. God gives unto us blessings, and we seek to do what? This sounds really weird, really weird. We take the finances that he gives us and seek in appropriate ways to make more finances. We seek the finances that he gives us and allows us and puts us in charge with to make more finances. Not so that more we can spend excessively on ourselves. But so with that more, we have more to give unto God, more to honor God with, more to give unto the needy, more to be hospitable with. So God's given us a gift. I mean, you give a a person a gift, and they take that gift, and they shove it in their closet and never open it. I mean, that's just like, what are you doing? God trusts us with the ability, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to work that he's working through us. So we take confidence in the fact that he's the owner and he's given us a job and he will give us the ability to complete it or that good work to complete it. So we take finances to make more finances for him. Lastly, 1 Timothy 5.8. Let's all go there. This is the last last way in which that I'm going to point out today that God tells us to manage our money. Oops. And this is just straight to the point. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. God's the owner. He gives us finances. Yes, to support the needy. Yes, to be hospitable. But also because he wants us to provide for not only our extended relatives, but also our immediate family. He wants us to do that. He desires us to do that, to be a provider unto our family. So those are seven ways that God tells us to manage his money. And you may be sitting there and saying, wait a second, John, I have a question. This is a hard question. You, one of the, way, the thing, the problem I have with my money is you didn't address it. It wasn't one of the seven. You know what, and John, I have looked through the scripture, I have looked through the scripture, and I just can't discern, I don't know what I am to do in this situation, in this financial situation. Well, just think about what we should do if we're questioning what we should do with God's money. I think if I hired a money manager, if I hired a money manager and said, hey, here's all my money, manage my money this way, and that money manager came up against a question, he says, well, I don't know if John wants me to invest the money this way. What would I want that money manager to do? I would want him to come to me and say, John, what do you want me to do with your money? I'm having a difficulty. I have a question here. And you know what? God operates the same way. He's the owner, and he's given us the responsibility of being money managers 
So when we have a question, what do we do? We bend the knee, we go to him and say, God, it's yours. What do you want me to do with these finances? God's also given us the body of Christ, which we can go to and seek out wisdom and say, hey, I'm having difficulty with this financial decision. And that's a tough conversation, but that's discipleship. In which we're seeking to say, how can I honor God in every way, even with my money? I want to close by quickly turning back to 1 Chronicles 29. You know that passage where David was praying. He's praying in front of everybody and declaring before all that his is the glory, his, 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 it's all God's. And then he says, thank you God, this process is so different. You allowing me to be a part, a money manager, handle your goods. I want us to get a sense because so often... We can walk out of a money talk and feel so stinking guilty and defeated and feel like, you know what, this is all meant to destroy me and this is not going to work out for good. But we see a completely different reality with David. David is saying, it's all yours. I've been seeking to manage it according to your will. And what's the result? The result isn't it's a burden. The result isn't life is miserable. Wow, I wish God would get off my back. No, it is absolute joy. Look at verse 16 of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. It says, O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for the building, you a house for your holy ones to come from from your hand, or excuse me, comes from your hand and is all your own. He's saying, you own it. You've given us the opportunity to do this. And then look at this. I love this. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure and uprightness and uprightness of heart Of my heart, I have freely offered these things. And now I have seen your people who who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. You read this passage and there's no hint of, darn, I gave to the needy today. There is no hint of, wow, I contributed to this temple of God. Shoot, that was a bad investment. None of that's here. It's all, look at the ability that God has given us. We manage, we're able to touch his finances and we're able through his grace and power to manage them in such a great way. And joy is the result. And I love the following verse. It says, O Lord, the God of Abraham, verse 18, Isaac and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts towards you. He's like, keep this doing, keep this going. This has been a blessing in my life. It's been a blessing to the lives around me. Keep this reality in the minds of all of these people. Don't stop this. Keep it going. Let it be a legacy of Israel that we all acknowledge that it's all yours and we're managing it the way you want us to manage. And you keep on reading and the result is joy, 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 and joy. It's not my money belt has been expanded. This is not health and wealth gospel. It's not I got a great big brand new house as a result of giving unto God. No, it's I got something better. I have the joy of the Lord because he owns it and I'm managing it in a way that is honoring to him. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about this subject. Next week, we're going to talk about our motives and money. The next week, we're going to talk about our future and money. The next week after that might be even more awkward today than today because we're going to talk about money in regards to the local church. And then we're going to dive into sexual orientation and all of those issues in our culture. But this is the Word of God. And we don't turn back from it. We're not ashamed of it. We don't hide under a rock. We say, this is the Word of God. Let's follow all of it with all that we have. Let's pray. Dear God, you're good and you're holy and you're mighty. And you are generous. You own all things. And you allow us, you give us the opportunity to handle, to touch, to manage your finances. And you give us the joy of honoring you with your finances. Today I pray for everyone in this room, including myself, that we would consider today your ownership of all things. And first we would be convicted if we need to be convicted. 
And we would go to you and confess that if we need to confess. But then we would be filled with joy because you are the God who forgives. And you are the God who strengthens. And you are the God who renews. And you are the God who enables to live as you have called us to live. May everything in our life scream yours, yours, yours. We lay it all down. We shout with joy, it's yours. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen.